Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader. Our guest today is Jamie Collinson, author of The Rejects. An alternate history, sorry, an alternative history of popular music. It's published by Constable, which is an imprint of Little Brown, which is an imprint of Hache, which seems to own everything. Um, it was released earlier this year. Jamie works in the music industry, including a period at the independent label uh, Ninja Tune, with artists such as Wiley, Roots Manuva, Bonobo, and Young Fathers. His novel, The Edge, was published in 2020. His work has also been included in various magazines and anthologies. He's written nonfiction pieces uh, for Guardian Online, Caught by the River, uh, Some Such Stories, and a number of other British and American periodicals. So what if you answered the phone? I mean, basically in your life, what if you had answered that phone call? What if you had taken an earlier train? What if you had asked that girl if she wanted to go to lunch? We all have moments like that in our lives. Mo uh, thousands of them, if not more, like that movie, uh, Sliding Doors. Um, but what if you were asked to join a rock and roll band and you did and you made it and your dreams had come true. And then one day you're out, you were fired. You were out of it because you were on drugs. You decide to leave and find greener pastures or you were just sick and tired, but mostly you were dumped. You know, you were gonna be a star or you were, but then quite suddenly it's over. Your best friends don't want to hang out with you. You're on the outside. They're tired of crap you do. They think you're not good enough. You think you're not good enough. Or you just don't want it well, as much as other people might. Whatever the cause, you're a reject. That's the title. So what do you do next? I mean, you know, you were Pete Best. You were Brian Jones. You were Flo. You were any number of people in Fleetwood Mac. Uh, mm -hmm. You might even have been in Nirvana. And you would wonder what the hell happened, why, or maybe you're dead. So Jamie explores the world of those rejects, the ones we may know about, do know about, and the ones that flew under our radar yesterday, maybe today, I guess, or even tomorrow. So let's explore the underworld of the rejects with Jamie. Welcome, Jamie. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. It's, it's a real pleasure. So it's really funny. I'm seeing the Stones tonight. Are you really? Wow. Yeah, in Philadelphia. And you know how they do that acoustic set where they come out and they have that circle? Yes. So I'm right in that row because I'm doing this as an anthropological experiment just to see, <laughs> are they doing it? What do they really look like? Do they act the way they act in the interviews with Jimmy Fallon? Um, and it's it's... I've seen, you know, I, as I said, I'm an old man. I've seen him. I've seen him in seven decades. Which that is was like, my next question. How many times have you seen them previously? 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010s. <laughs> wow. You saw them in the 60s? Yep. Um, I don't remember it because <laughs> I was in the same altered state of mind that they might have been in. Do you what's, know they're here? What's really funny is because of your book, I hadn't thought of this. But I'm seeing them tonight without Brian Jones, without Mick Taylor, who I once saw in concert by himself in a 100-seat theater, uh, without Charlie Watts, without Ian Stewart, who you talk about, and without Bobby Keys also. So I guess, you know, we if we go, we're not going to be able to get to everybody. But n we'll go back to Pete Best. But then since I'm talking about the Stones, why don't we talk about Brian Jones, who's right up there in the front of your book. And yeah. I think I know, you know, I know a lot about him, but the people who are listening to this, there's only going to be a few that are my age. So tell yeah. me a little bit about that story. Yeah, I find Brian Jones fascinating. I mean, for a number of reasons, I suppose, firstly, he's, he's part of this group that I refer to as the ultra elite rejects in the book, in that he was one of the actual band leaders that then got sacked. Um, and that, you know, I think that's a particularly painful form of um, rejection if you actually started the band and then end up being kicked out. But um, it strikes me that he had this very interesting upbringing. You know, he, he was 
he seemed to have been quite a good kid at first. He was into model trains, I think, and loved playing cricket. He was raised in this slightly frosty Christian household, which then became much frostier when his younger sister died of leukemia at the age of one. I think she was, she was a baby. Um, and his parents were quite emotionally repressed. And then he he was sort of cursed with asthma, which seems to have spoiled all of his hopes at sort of playing sports, which he was quite into. And he seems to have turned almost kind of curdled and become quite a, a dark, mean character, you know, which is interesting because he's got that sort of, he almost looks like a mean cherub, but, you know, obviously it's silly to, to, to relate people's physical characteristics to their character, but in his case, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, and all of that led to, when he discovered music, it led to this interesting, so he wasn't allowed to play the music he liked, the, the, he was obsessed with blues, the Delta blues, and, uh, you know, he knew a lot about it, and he started playing it from an early age. And he wasn't allowed to play those records at home or to, or to practice the guitar at home, really, which drove him out of the house and onto stages. And he became, at a very, very young age, as a 15, 16, he was playing the blues, traveling to London and, um, uh, and appearing on stage. And he became one of the most practiced blues guitar players in the UK at a very early age. He just had all this stage time. And he, he blossomed very early. He was incredibly talented. He looked amazing. He had this blonde hair. He was full of confidence. And, um, you know, a, a huge contrast to Mick and Keith, who, who were these very suburban boys. And there's this great moment when they first see him, which is described in lots of the books about the Stones. And he's up there blazing on the stage in his white shirt and his blonde hair, playing this music. And, and they're just absolutely stunned by him. And, you know, I think very early on, this this sort of this process of appropriation starts to take place where they want to be like him and and that that's basically the story of the early stones you know particularly in Keith's case gradually becoming him as he as he starts to fade away and then Mick kind of finally there's this great image from Marianne Faithful that, that after he he died Mick was left free to finally become him and there's almost this kind of vampiric process which of course he he helps along by behaving very very badly and uh, you know not taking care of himself at all and certainly doing some horrible things to other people. Um, so yeah, for all of those reasons, I think he's a, he's a very exciting and interesting character. Yeah, I remember, um, you know, after you know because Keith had an affair with his girlfriend, the famous what's her name, the model Anita Pallenberg. Yeah. Yeah, and and because of his drug addiction, and I remember watching on TV the live concert in Hyde Park, which was two days after he died, and I remember Keith talking, quoting William Blake, I guess, about now we see through a glass darkly, um, it's the doors of perception. Yeah. And really thinking that they loved Brian, and it was such a loss, but he had already been kicked out for all those different reasons, but it really did move me. Yeah, and in the background, as, as I say in the book, actually Mick was really annoyed that he died two days before. He was worried that it, it would sort of uh, cast a shadow over this big event in Hyde Park. And, you know, there, there, there is something quite mercenary about the, and beady-eyed about the Stones, isn't there, and Mick and Keith, which explains why, you know, you're, you're still going to see them tonight. You, you need that to, if you're going to make it that long as a band, you, you really must have that, you know, real kind of, that, that splinter of ice in the heart that I refer to in the book. Yeah, and I guess jumping ahead, um, like I said, seeing Mick Taylor just sitting there in front of me, you realize, and even Mick and Keith kind of realize, in some ways, during the most productive years of the Stones, he might have been the best musician of the Stones. And even Mick says some people think that was the best years of our group. And, you yeah. know, which, which might be upsetting to Ronnie Wood. But you know, even now when he comes on stage, they bring him on stage to Midnight Rambler. It just sounds different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's interesting that one of the I started out writing the book with this idea that the that there was a kind of, you know that the first lineup that romantic idea the original lineup is always 
best. And but then actually that pleasingly that that illusion was kind of shattered a bit in the writing of the book. And I I think most of these bands that do go on a long time, it's more about what the optimal lineup is for a certain record or a period or an aesthetic and what they're trying to achieve. And I think the Stones are very much an example of that. You know, Fleetwood Mac would be the other sort of big one, I guess. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it must be difficult for these characters who who come in and then go out and see the thing going on without them. I think for for, for a lot of people, it, they never get over it, and it kind of breaks them having to having to watch that happen. Yeah, and sometimes it's just totally arbitrary. Like Andrew Lug Oldham, who I have mixed feelings about at best. Um, the way Ian Stewart was summarily kicked out and before that he was hidden behind a screen and it was the basic reason was too many guys in the band. You don't want to Yeah. Six and the look of his face going back to physical characteristics. Okay. I mean, that, that's one of the other themes that really emerges in the book is, you know, we all know that aesthetics are very, very important in music. And, you know, there, there's this, on the surface, there's this idea that it doesn't really matter, and especially in, in, the, in the modern age, we don't think it matters. But actually, it's just it, it's an unconscious thing, and, and it does really matter. And that's why so many pop stars look great and bands look great. So, you know, don't necessarily need to be good looking, but they need to look great in one way or another. And Ian Stewart's face was he had this very prominent chin, and he looked like a kind of 1930s character actor. And it, it was just, the, you know, Andrew Lou, Lou Goldham, I, I also have mixed feelings about him, but I think he was probably right about that. It just, you know, it, it just didn't, the picture didn't work. And it, I actually, I interviewed the, the great music writer, David Hepworth, who gave me that story because he that's his favourite rejection story. Um, and he referred to, to this quote from... Um, uh, from Brian Epstein about the Beatles and he said that only when Ringo joined did the picture make sense and you know I think probably unconsciously he was referring to that thing we all have where suddenly you're like ah yes it looks it looks right and that's of huge importance in a band and, and probably you know not an importance that we all admit to. It's funny because I don't know how you knew this but you said he looked like William Bendix who's an American guy and I remember when I was a kid watching this black and white comedy called uh, Life with Riley. And that was William Bendix. I don't even know how you remember that or how you figured that out. Well, you know, I have to give credit to, uh, to David Hepworth there. That was his, uh, that's very much his, his point. He, he's a little bit older than me, so um, he probably does remember. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because you mentioned uh, the Beatles and you kind of start off with that, you know, Pete forever, Ringo never, yeah. and Cavern Club. And, you know, he's, to me, like, he, he, you'll see him once in a while on talk shows. He's, to me, the most, I don't know, sad story. And and I always admire them, those, because I don't know if I could be this way, who said, okay, you know, it happened, it's over, I've gotten over it, I've lived my life. But to be sacked the way he was sacked with, you know, and you have this all the, all through your book where someone tells one thing, the stories are all different. You yeah. know, it's either Brian fired him or John went in and said, you're fired. And yeah. well, yeah, well, again, uh, I'm telling this as if everyone knows it, they don't. So, you know, people say, who's Paul McCartney? They go, oh, he was the guy in wings, you know? <laughs> yeah. Kids think that. Yeah. No, yeah, so, so Pete Best, there's another great quote from a music writer in the book, actually, Craig Brown, who wrote this fantastic book. I don't know if you've read One, Two, Three, Four, The Beatles in Time. Oh, yeah. It's one of the best music books I've ever read. And in that book, he says that Pete Best's name is one of the few names that can still darken the atmosphere when, it, when it's mentioned. But he was um, the Beatles' first drummer. And... Um, he he very importantly he well I, I think it's safe to say that the Beatles probably wouldn't have carried on wouldn't have existed without him in the sense that he and his mother his mother was this very picturesque character who had this huge house in Liverpool and a big basement and uh, Pete was very into um into into music and he wanted a space that he could listen to records and have you know his fledgling bandmates over in the various bands he was in and so his mum founded the, the Casbah Coffee Club in the basement of her house. 
and bands were allowed to play there. It was all so so they were being fostered and encouraged. And the, the Quarrymen, the, the the first band that um, John Lennon and Paul McCartney were in, came there. They liked the way Pete was drumming. They had a place to play and rehearse. They they ended up getting together with him, and he really drove the band forward. He was just as ambitious as they were. After they were, were all kicked out of Hamburg, he actually managed them for a period, and you know was was calling up the. You had to have a phone in those days to make anything happen. And again, he was allowed to ring up the venues and make bookings. Very importantly, he and Mona got the gear back from Hamburg, which was extremely difficult and complicated in those days. Um, and, you know, I think there's a very strong argument to be made that they would have broken up after they got kicked out of Hamburg if he hadn't done all of that. And... And then there's this famous sacking. He, you know, he had no inkling really until another band said, you know, we've heard something might be happening. When are you going to join us? And he, he said, are you, are you mad? Why would I leave the Beatles? We're about to blow up. He asked um, Brian Epstein if this was true. And uh, he said no. And then went back for another meeting a couple of days later, as I remember it. And, and finally was told, yeah, I'm sorry, you are. Well, there's this horrible moment where they're in the van after a gig or after a rehearsal. And he, he says to John Lennon, who was his closest friend in the band, I'll pick you up tomorrow as normal, John. And John says, no, thanks. I've got other arrangements. And that's those are the last words that Lennon ever speaks to him. Um, yeah, and suddenly he's out. And he's never he's told this is because George Martin thinks he's not a good enough drummer. Um, John Lennon sort of leapt to take responsibility for it in his way of kind of protecting his, his his inner vulnerability by always trying to look like the mean guy and the hard guy. But actually in, in Craig Brown's book, he he sort of um, comes to the conclusion, well, actually George, George Harrison did eventually say, actually it was me. I just didn't, every time Ringo joined us, Ringo joined them when he was sick, or uh, which had happened on a couple of occasions. And he said it just it just felt much better when Ringo was there. So I gradually worked on the rest of the band and said, you know, I think we need to get rid of him. And George Harrison was this kind of silent assassin who uh, made it happen and only took responsibility for it many years later. Um, but yeah, it's the kind of original sin in in the sort of you know famous sackings, I guess. And it led to a, a rapid decline for Pete Best. He tried to kill himself. Uh, but then he bounced back and he became, he got a job as a civil servant and, he, you know, he seems to be out there as a relatively happy, successful guy. He's still going. And in some ways, it's one of the happier stories because he did reach that pit fairly quickly and then, and then bounced back. Um, so, yeah, that's his story. It's like a long-winded answer there. I'm sorry. It's all right. The thing about the book that's interesting is <clears throat> it's also, it became also fresh in my mind and it always... It made me think of so many things like the fact that even I think you mentioned too that you know Ringo was in Hamburg also with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes and also I was thinking okay what if what if what if and then I was thinking you know they liked Pete he, Pete looked good but they but Stu Sutcliffe looked really good <laughs> yeah and, and then he, but he dies and if he didn't die I have no idea what would have happened and it and would you have five members and would they all gravitate towards him that's always been a question in my mind and how much how much astrid had influence on the beatles i just interviewed this guy last week who wrote this book called shake it up baby um and it's just the beatles in 1960 it just it's just 1963 and he talks a lot about that and john lennon too i'll have to read that yeah i mean astrid kushner and um What's the name of, uh, I, I, I've suddenly forgotten the name of her ex-boyfriend who then became their designer and did the yeah. revolt. It's uh, Klaus Warman. Yes. So the, the hair, you know, again, going back to aesthetics, the, the, these tribal signifiers that don't seem very important, but but it seems that the, that the mop top hair came from him. And, and obviously there's this moment when they get rid of the 1950s rock and roll quiffs and they, they come up with this ra relatively radical mop top. And importantly, Pete Best didn't do that. And um, yeah, you know, that, that does seem to spell his doom in many ways. That, that's, the, that's the obvious outer, you know, visual signifier that his, his days are numbered. 
And, um, you know, it just comes back to this idea of how aesthetic, uh, how important tribal aesthetics are, you know, hair and clothes and drugs. You know, if you're not on, you're not wearing the right stuff, wearing your hair the right way or taking the right drugs, you, you're often not, not long for the band. Yeah, it's funny because I think what the mark of a really good book is the fact that it makes you think of other things. And when you're done with a book, you're still looking up stuff. So one of the things I did was because I have all my albums still in the garage and I went and I picked up, even though I could have done it on the net, picked up Revolver because I remember that the cover art was done by Klaus Vorman and it's really good cover art. Yeah. Yeah. I love that cover. And I mean, it, arguably that's the best record, isn't it? I mean, obviously, you know, the, the, that that's a fun argument to have, but the critical consensus seems to be the Revolver's the, the one and the, yeah that, that cover is just fantastic and that kind of the, the edge of changing from the pop band into the experimental art band Re revolve even whether is it whether it's best or not it was definitely a tipping point yeah yeah absolutely yeah i think i think abbey road is probably my favorite but um we could spend all day on that <laughs> i know that's the thing we got to get away from the stones and the beatles to get into the, the things that take us into the present day because <laughs> that's what <laughs> yeah. we so one of the one of the ones and yeah i'm not doing it in any particular order and like i said we can't do everything but if we switch gears completely and i always felt really bad for her and um cindy bird song whatever her name was anyway yeah so talk a little bit about flow and the supremes and how things kind of shifted and and then diana ross and her weird stories yeah <laughs> i mean th this for me is the saddest story in the book because of how broken Florence, you know, we, we, yeah, Florence, so you know, Florence Ballard again is in that ultra elite group of rejects in that she, she founded the, the Supreme, she, she came up with the name, she got them together. I mean, you know, she founded them in the technical sense. I think very quickly Diana Ross became the dominant figure, but you know, they fairly early on, they signed some signs of Motown and Barry Gordy, straight away picks out Diana Ross as having, her voice was in a higher register, which he saw as more pop, I think probably rightly, you know, but, but to, to be blunt about it. Florence was a, was a great singer, but she had more of a gospel voice. And I think, but, you know, very good. He was obviously listening out for a more pop sound. Um, and Florence had, she came from a family where there was a bit of alcoholism running in the family. And she struggled with all sorts of things, but primarily she had a terrible tragedy in her life, which was that she was raped as a teenager at a, at a high school ball. And obviously we were even less good at, at dealing with those things in the sixties. And, you know, it, it wasn't really dealt with in any meaningful way. And she, I think it's safe to say she never really recovered from it. And she, she turned to alcohol as a kind of a coping mechanism uh, Barry Gordy treated her very badly. He, he constantly referred to her weight. And, you know, she, she was slightly bigger than Diana Ross, but certainly not in any, you know, she, she wasn't fat by any stretch of the imagination, but he was always telling her that she was. And she began to rebel against that by deliberately sticking her tummy out on stage. And um, she started to have arguments with him. And with, with the, obviously, he then gets into a romantic relationship with Diana Ross, which clearly means that she becomes the the, the the powerhouse in the group and the dominant figure and sidelines Florence further. And all of these things spiral. They get to the point where, where Florence throws a drink in Barry Goody's face and is fired. And again, she, she never really recovers from all of this and, and goes into a fairly steep descent. And very sadly, she, she died at the age of 32 in, in 1976, I think. And she had a very, very difficult life after she, she was sacked. She, she was stripped of her royalties, treated really brutally. She wasn't allowed to use the Supreme's name. You know, again, she, she'd actually come up with that name. So for me, she's the real tragedy in, in the book and the darkest. I mean, there are a lot of dark stories in there, but she's the one that I find saddest and darkest I think it's just such a horrible story and if someone had looked after her and managed her in a way that um, you know a manager is supposed to nurture a group and and um you know some of those problems could could maybe have been solved or treated if, if they'd had a, a more nurturing figure 
around them. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a very sad story. The thing about it, the thing about the book is that a lot of times I forget that it's set against the backdrop, like you were saying back in the '60s. This wasn't thought of the same way, and back in the '60s, one, no one had any idea that these things would blow up, and just like Taylor Swift now, no one had any idea when she started out in country music that this is now that she's a billionaire and the, the you know the the heiress tours beyond anything that could have possibly have been imagined. But the, another way that we can approach this too is if we want to get into a bunch of different people is if you think about John Mayo on the Blues Breakers, um, he's he's 90 years old and he's still playing. Yeah. And and but then you can talk about Danny Carlin, you can talk about um, well, obviously Eric Clapton and I think Stevie Winwood, but you can talk about um, Peter Green. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can go to Fleetwood Mac because <laughs> that's the story. <laughs> I always sound it's just kind of funny. Yeah, it's funny to me because there's so many incarnations. As far as I'm concerned, Peter Green playing then play on at Oh Well is pretty much the apex of Fleetwood Mac for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, such a fascinating band in terms of lineup. And I say in the book that um, I think Mick Fleetwood, when he becomes the band leader, you know, after the era of Peter Green. It was hard to get fired by Mick Fleetwood because he, due to his own predilections, he's a very tolerant figure. You know, like him and um, uh, so several members of the group were, were at times, I think, fired from the from John Mayall's Blues Breakers for drinking, weren't they? Well, I think it was John Mayall's Blues Breakers that, that fired um, John, certainly John McVie and Mick Fleetwood, I think, were both sacked for drinking. And, and Mick Fleetwood clearly didn't want to ever sack anybody and so each sacking is a really painful moment. <laughs> and You know, the first one, Danny Kerwan, another figure that I feel really sympathetic towards. He was this meticulous figure, again, a bit damaged. I think his father left when he was very young. He was gradually becoming an alcoholic and he wanted to rehearse and he wanted to know what he was doing and he wanted to, to play meticulously. And that's what made him great. And his idol was Peter Green, he was a fan of the band. He was turning up to help them load up and stuff. And uh, and Peter Green and Mick, Mick Fee would eventually think, well, why, why don't we just get him in the band? And and then he's destroyed in in a in a sense by the the the, the things that make them great. So Peter Green, when Jeremy Spencer leaves the band to go and join the the Children of God, just randomly in LA after taking really potent mescaline. Um, they they desperate they haven't got a guitarist and so they, they they beg peter green to come back and he very nobly does come back even though he said that he's going to quit music he said he says yeah definitely i'll come back and help but only on only on the basis that every night we we go out and play a totally improvised show <laughs> and the rest of the band are all terrified of this but particularly danny kerwan so <laughs> You know, he's had to step forward to, to to play in a major band that his idol has departed from and now his idol comes back and says, well, the way that you like doing it, that's not going to happen. It has to all be improvised. And, you know, Danny Cohen again, just loves everything to be minutely rehearsed. So, you know, he's not eating very well. He's drinking too much. And it gets to the point where he just has a breakdown and it takes this, this, this horrible violent episode backstage where he smashes his beautiful Les Paul, I think it was, and smashes all the mirrors and headbutts things and blood, there's blood everywhere. And then he goes and sits at front of house, watches the band play without him, and then goes backstage afterwards and gives them a very unfavorable review. <laughs> and it takes all of that for him to get fired. You know, they, they, again, it is a, a completely different guitarist, but I think sometimes I would, in the book I was going, they're so good, they can't succeed. Yeah. You know, they're, they're too good to be there. And, uh, and you talk about innocence, you talk about their looks. But, you know, it reminds me, like, even in U2, like the Edge, he's so meticulous that he has his own board and everything has to be tweaked absolutely perfectly, but it's worked for them. Because, yeah. You know? Yeah. And, yeah, it's just interesting that some of the reasons they're not, these guys aren't there anymore is because they're too good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it can be that a player is too good and, and thus they want to explore and have ambitions that outstrip the band and... So, you know, again, I say in the book that sometimes a band will tolerate a subpar player if they make the social unit work better. Because bands are really weird things, aren't they? They're, 
they usually start off as a sort of social unit, but they very quickly become about, about money. And obviously it's about art, it's about business, it's about the, the friendship. Um, it can be about purely professional relationships. So that they are unique among social organizations and, and those are lots of competing factors. And it might be that you take a player who isn't the best because they, they're not going to destroy the social group. And I guess in the U2 is a really interesting example because they famously they split the money from day one, including with their late manager, I think. And having written this book, I'd say that the number one bit of advice you would give to a band if they want to stay together would be split everything from the outset. And yeah. you know, the, the Edge is one of those people that has a, a style without being brilliant, right? He, he has that immediately identifiable style, but I don't think he would say that he's a genius guitar player. I think they all said that they couldn't play their instruments when they got together. And but he's got that chiming affected thing that just works for the band. So yeah, there are all these dynamics of play. You don't necessarily want the best guitarist in the world because they might end up, you know, going into places you don't you don't want to go. And they might not be biddable. I think that's what often happens. The the singer is the band the, the reason so many singers and lead guitarists fall out is because the singer tends to be the band leader, but the lead guitarist is just as big a presence and just as ambitious and possibly a better musician. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because like, and sometimes let me just suck it up. Like when George Harrison wrote only a Northern song, you know, he and Ringo were getting 0.8%, uh, but he just did it as a joke, you know, but he's the one in Get Back that says, I'll be leaving the band now. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that moment. I mean, you know, I'm sure everybody listening to your podcast probably you probably has seen that. And love, but I, I I just thought I think I started watching and I was doing the usual bad habit of occasionally looking at my phone, and and then suddenly George was leaving. And I thought actually, if I'm going to watch this, it's all about those little undercurrents, and you just can't be doing anything else. So I sat there and let it mesmerize me. And yeah, I mean, you know, for, for a for actually watching band dynamics play out, that's an unbeatable thing to observe, I think. And that moment with the the, the, the microphone in the flower pot when when Paul and John are actually arguing about the, the nature of the Beatles and who owns it, I mean, that's just gold dust, isn't it? I, I, it was unbelievable. It was almost as if someone had done it with AI. You know, the, no, you've always been the boss. No, you've always been the boss. It's always been your band. Um, yeah. And then just... Uh, anecdotally, the end of, of Get Back, as someone who's worked in the music industry, what struck me was how, how for how long people have been obfuscating police officers at live music events. You know, I've seen so much of that in my career. Going, oh yeah, we will turn it down, but we need to, we just can't quite get this soundboard over there to do what we want it to do, but give us five more minutes. And, you know, it's all there, you know, kind of, oh yeah, we can't get to the roof because the that's closed and actually the control box is in the basement, but we are working on it. <laughs> like, and, yeah, and the good thing about Get Back versus Let It Be was Get Back showed the whole concert on yeah. the roof of all the suing with the let it be um yeah now we're getting off track <laughs> we're, we're, we're keeping it very 60s i think this is a bit of an old I know, okay, I'll, well even this one's going to be the 60s <laughs> but this one is interesting because to me and seeing them live as well uh velvet underground and john kale john kale is is like a he's a genius an absolute yeah. genius yeah but they couldn't there was no way that Lou Reed and John Cale could have stayed together. No, no, it's really interesting, isn't it? Again, that, you know, I think Lou Reed, he just went back on his own. They got together to do something really, diff not, not difficult, but challenging and new and abrasive. And there's that great quote in the book that John Cale recognised the, the, the genius in Lou Reed's words and said, but it, didn't, it, it couldn't have worked with the usual folk rock accompaniment it needed rapturous sonic adornment i think he says and that kind of and that's what really strikes you isn't it that the, the viola the viola and the those kind of abrasive textures that when you first hear the velvet underground as a youngster you just think you know it's just so striking but lou reed went back on it and decided that he would actually kind of like to be a pop star in the traditional mold and then he changed his mind again um but yeah, I think those two talents were too, I mean, there, there was so much 
you know, they, they were deliberately taking hard, nasty drugs when their, you know, rival bands were taking sort of nice, soft, hippie drugs. And, you know, they, they almost set out to be a sort of much more nihilistic kind of, I say, yeah, again, there's that great quote about um, that they could have been a nihilistic um, Lennon McCartney if they carried on going. But if you put all that into a band, it's, it's definitely an explosive mix that isn't destined to last. But uh, God, yeah, produced some great results when it did. Yeah, you couldn't talk about everybody, but even if you think about Nico too. And then Nico and John Kale worked together and she had the most unique voice. But again, it just, it couldn't, it couldn't have worked. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, I suspect I, I, work, I was lucky enough to work with John Kale or on, on John Kale um, at, at Domino, which is now his label. Sadly, it was kind of COVID time, so I never actually met him. But I suspect he doesn't suffer fools, and I suspect he knows what to, you know, he, he's not going to be a sort of sideman. Um, so, yeah, you know, the, 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 that means that you'll always be, you're probably not going to be in a stable band I guess unless you're the driving force within it but as a result it freed him up to do all the you know he's been a pioneer of left field interesting art music for, for decades hasn't he? he's still going strong and um still making great music so and it freed him up to do great things with to be the person that made things good with other people you know obviously notably Barry um yeah yeah and it's funny too because I can tell, I could tell in the book where your obsessions lie because <laughs> there was a good deal of time on the replacement Guns N' Roses and Nirvana. And uh, it's funny because we're talking about Let It Be. And I remember when I bought the replacements, Let It Be, and I thought, I got to buy this because it says Let It Be. <laughs> yeah. so it was right the day I bought the Iggy Stooge album, which is another story. But um, yeah, talk about the replacements because they could have been really something big, but they never were. And you mentioned, you mentioned that in the book. Yes, yeah, I mean, they, they almost, yeah, again, uh, th that classic tension between lead guitarist Bob Stinson and and, um, and singer Paul Westerberg. And again, Stinson, so Stinson is, is the character for our purposes because he was fired and Again, he's in that group of rejects that, that, that technically at least formed the group. But not only that, his, his half brother was in the group and he got him into the group to keep him out of trouble. So I think his firing was extremely painful to him. And again, it's about it's about myth and reality in that the band, I think Bob Stinson would have, would have said, I mean, I don't think he would have said this because he didn't talk about the band in this way, but I think he saw the band as being deliberately punk and nihilistic and, and not being about ambition and success you know that they wanted to, to play to their people and and be big in their own way in their own punk rock clubs um but he bought into the myth of the band which is there in the name that they're this second rate they're the replacements they're they're broke and beat and and paul westerberg actually was ambitious he you know he started off buying into the myth, I guess, but really he had chops and he he was writing songs that were incre increasingly in a kind of classic rock mold. And I think he wanted to be big, although there was always a part of him that sabotaged it. You know, they, they'd get drunk before doing TV shows or they'd refuse to do promo. But I do think there was a large part of him that really wanted to make it. And that led to this increasing tension because Bob Stinson just got drunker and drunker and you know, messed about and that they were known for being either totally inspiring or absolutely terrible. And that was part of the deal with the replacements. Um, and it all comes to a head on there's that famous Saturday Night Live performance when uh, booze had already been banned backstage or they smuggled a load in and Bob Stinson was doing all sorts of drugs. And uh, he's charging around the, the soundstage dressed in this crazy outfit of sort of lurid bell bottoms and a a woman's uh, open vest and um, Westerberg sort of kicks him in the bum or tries to kick him in the bum and then, and then I don't know, what's your policy on swearing? Are we allowed to, we allowed to swear? I, I always, whenever I do, um, YouTube doesn't pass the video and I love yeah. to swear. We'll, we'll oh, refrain. So Westerberg says, come on, Effa, 
and steps back from the microphone to do so, but it gets picked up on the mic and they get into all sorts of trouble. And, and this leads to Stinson's sacking, They're not directly, those, I think there was, there was a couple of weeks or even a month or so to go. And then there's this horrible, tragic incident where Stinson does get clean in order to stay in the band. Uh, and when he turns up to a show, Westerberg say, opens a bottle of champagne and says, either take a drink or get off my stage. So deliberately knocks him back off the wagon. And, and that's it for him. He never recovers from it. He gets fired and he, he becomes a really broken figure, you know, living on the, uh, living in Minneapolis, kind of drinking heavily, taking all sorts of drugs, not having any access to his son, uh, estranged from his wife, and giving these hor horrible interviews, you know, he gave this horrific interview to Spin, where he's trying to get the journalist to do drugs with him. He's obviously completely lonely. Um, and is found dead in his apartment of organ failure eventually. Uh, so yeah, that, that one really looms large for me because it's another very cruel story. But also he was a vulnerable figure. He'd been in, a, you know, it, it becomes clear later that he'd most likely been abused by a, a boyfriend of his mother's. He'd been in and out of juvenile detention and he had been trying to do the right thing. And, you know, the band was designed to, keep everyone out of trouble and most most particularly his younger half brother who was following a similar path um and all he did really was buy into what the what was supposed to be the myth of the band that they were rock and roll rebels and would be drunk and crazy and broken um yeah so it's uh, another another sad story unfortunately but um a great a great band yeah it's interesting that you know you talk in the book about like the Velvet Underground wanting to be the anti-Beatles and replacements too and Iggy Stooge and it seems like it's really hard when you're the anti-Beatles like you were saying eventually someone wants to be a little more pop <laughs> yeah and then that screws up the whole idea of the band but if they're anti-Beatles they probably aren't looking to become really popular oh the perfect example is Nirvana they they didn't really they weren't looking for what they got no, well, tell, that, tell the story about Nirvana. We might as well go into that. Yeah, so so this is the happiest story in the book, in a sense, because um, and it, it was the inspiration for writing the book. So so there's a there's a minor character in musical history called Jason Everman, and and um, I remembered him. Uh, he he loomed large for me, despite being a very small character in the history of music, because Nirvana they still are my favorite band, really, but they were the band that really. I had my Sex Pistols moment with when I was kind of 12 or whatever I was. Um, and I, I had a poster that I had that, J, that Jason Evan was, was in when they were a four piece before they went back to being a three piece before they then became a four piece again. Um, and Jason Evan was, was the second guitarist in Nirvana, never played a note on a record, but he paid for the recording of Bleach. And he also paid for at least some of the shows and probably the whole tour around Bleach and he was fired for being far too moody and silent on that tour. Uh, he then went on to join Soundgarden which was a band he actually preferred because he was more into a heavier sound and again was fired fairly quickly for being too moody so you can imagine how moody you'd have to be to be fired from those two very yeah. moody bands and you know Chris Cornell famously quite moody too. Um, but he, it was what happened to him afterwards that really I found inspiration on that. So after a few years of floating around being a rocker, he once on the tour bus, he'd said to Chris Novoselic of Nirvana, have you ever wondered what it would be like to be in the military and just go through that experience? And Chris Novoselic's like, no. Um, but Jason Everman does go and join up and he becomes a, he got military people in his family. He was raised in a remote Alaskan island and uh, was very tough. He'd made all that money that he spent on Bleach and, and the tour doing fishing on his father's fishing boat in Alaska, which was brutal work. And he made a lot of money for a teenager. So he joins up and uh, he finds his true calling and winds up being a, a highly decorated Green Beret who fought in Afghanistan and in, uh, in Iraq, you know, really at the peak intensity of special forces soldiering in, in those 
Stanley McChrystal driven uh, raids in Afghanistan in particular. And he ends up leaving the military. General McChrystal writes him a letter of commendation and he, he goes and does a philosophy degree at Columbia University in New York and ends up being this completely fulfilled kind of warrior philosopher figure who is now, you know, primarily sailing boats and taking part in the race to Alaska and uh, all sorts of stuff. And he he was the the inspirational figure in the book in that he was he found his true calling much later. He was never destined to be the second guitarist in in Nirvana or the or the bassist in Soundgarden. And he gets his kind of rock star life in the sense that now people go out, young uh, soldiers go out to his sister and say, oh my God, are you Jason Everman's sister? You know, have you any idea what that guy's done? Um, and he, yeah, I mean, there is a tragic element in that obviously he was still floundering around doing the wrong thing when his band leader was was blossoming and reaching you know what turned out to be his pinnacle and then and then killing himself and in Jason Everman's family you've got this military history which inspired him to to do that but in Kurt Cobain's family you've got multiple suicides and and that apparently is statistically just as likely to it's a very high signifier of a suicide if you've got you know, if, if there's a template in your family, and certainly if there's more than one template, then the likelihood is much higher. Um, so they make a, a tragic contrast, but it was a great way to look at the Nirvana story. And again, the con the outsized contribution to, to these rejects make. So without Jason Everman, Kurt Cobain himself uh, more or less admitted, it freed Kurt Cobain up to become a front man. He didn't have to focus on playing guitar. You know, he was still learning his chops as a guitarist. And he could focus more on singing and, and being at the front and thrashing around. And after they fired Jason Everman, he'd managed to absorb all of that and then could go back to doing that and playing guitar. And so without Jason Everman, you don't get Bleach recorded, you don't get the tour happening, you don't get Kurt learning how to be a front man. And that's, you know, a contribution that someone made by just being in the band for a few months. So there are these amazing stories buried out there that, that actually explain quite a lot about major bands and um that that was the fun of the book who was the who was it that kurt cobain tried to reach right before he killed himself mark was rannigan it? he he called mark rannigan I, again i say in the book his specter really hangs over the book because he's connected to so many of the characters in the book rannigan was obviously just a great rock figure of his generation but yeah, they're in their junkie seclusion. Lanigan loved Kurt Cobain, obviously wouldn't have known who was calling, but didn't pick up the phone. And then um, he and Dylan Carlson from Earth, who was another junkie brother in arms of the pair of them, one of Kurt's best friends, that they're, they're the pair that go and look for him while he's lying upstairs dead above the garage. Um, and he, Dylan Carlson was the guy who famously Kurt made had to buy the shotgun for him because he'd lost his access to weapons after behaving erratically and having the police called a few months before killing himself it's funny because this is really weird i was listening to him i didn't know anything about mark Lennon again and i was listening to him play hit the city with pj clark oh, such a great song incredible song i would i played it over and over again i said i need to find out about this guy so i went to wikipedia looked him up he died that day. Oh, really? Oh, that's awful. I know. Yeah. It was so weird because I, I, my my wife got pissed off at me because I just kept playing it over and over and over again. And that the harmony between PJ Clark and him, you can't really explain what it is. Because, yeah. But so it's another great song on that album with her on it too. Because Bubblegum from that album is a great record. And there's another song... It's called Come To Me, uh, track nine on the album, also featuring PJ Harvey, really oh, haunting. It, yes. it's, it's, it's the most darkly beautiful song. Yeah, I, I mean, he made all sorts of great records. And he's a big con contributor to Queens of the Stone Age, uh, one of my favorite bands. And, um, you know, he's been on some of their best work. And when, the uh, with Queens of the Stone Age, when um, Dave Grohl played with them. Yeah. Really good. That one song, I forgot what it was. It was really good. 
Well, he's on the, on the whole that he plays drums throughout Songs of the Deaf, which is arguably the great record. And I think he came back to play on their other masterpiece, like Clockwork. Um, but yeah, that kind of heavy, propulsive, because it's just great hearing Dave Grohl do. I mean, the Foo Fighters are, you know, great, but it's a popular thing, isn't it? And to hear him doing hard rock again with, the, with Queens of the Stone Age is always very exciting. Hit the city is, uh, and I'll get off of it. But Hit the city is like this kind of song. When it's over, you wish it was longer. Yeah, yeah, because the sonics of that record, that kind of driving, distorted guitar. Yeah, and I, I don't know what what his life was like when he was making that record. I don't know if he got clean already, but I really recommend his book "Sing Backwards and Weep," which is um. It's, it's the most unflinching, non unglamorous take on a rock star's life. He's totally honest about it. And he, his addiction was one of the worst I've ever, you know, he literally ended up living under a tarpaulin in a park in Seattle under a freeway bridge, you know, the, the worst of the worst. Um, but a fantastic musician and character. And he was saved by, um, by two unlikely figures, Courtney Love and Duff McKagan, who, who has gone out of his way to save uh, a few different characters and tried to save Kurt Cobain again, as I say in the book. He, he no, he didn't try. He he had a strong instinct to when they met in Seattle Airport. He what he really wanted to take Kurt, just say, "Do you want to come back to my place?" Because Kurt looked so troubled, and Kurt killed himself three days later. And Duff McKagan never really got over that. And and I think in if future opportunities arose like that, he would always take them. And he famously turned up at when Mark Lanigan was being, had finished his rehab program, picked him up, said, you can borrow my car, you can live in my house in LA, you can have some clothes, whatever you need, let's get you away from all this. So, um, you know, an amazing figure in, in saving other musicians. The thing about Lanigan is you can hear what's happening to him in his music. Yeah. No, it's, it's very strange. It's so unflinching and so dark, but so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I'm increasingly fascinated by him as a character. And I, I love that book. I can't recommend that book highly enough. I'll read it. The other one, that this one was the only one that I would not have included simply because I hate Axl Rose. And <laughs> he's so such a self-indulgent self baby. But... Um, but you spend a lot of time on Guns N' Roses, so you must have spent a lot of your life listening to them as well. Yeah, I mean, before Nirvana, you know, I talk about this, how obviously those two bands hated each other, but largely because they're the two great bands of their generations, I think, and, and you know, the, the revolution was the change from one to the other. Um, but but they were the, the other band, I think I heard them when I was seven or something, and, you know, it just blew me away. I'd never heard anything. So it was obviously very beautiful, melodic, but really dark and kind of, nasty and mean and explicit and um yeah I, you know i still think appetite for destruction is a masterpiece and i would have been very ashamed to say i was into guns and roses between the ages of about you know 12 or 13 and probably about 36 <laughs> certainly in many of my indie music jobs i would never have mentioned that uh but the, the beauty of getting older is that you can worry less about this stuff um, but, and obviously he did really, really disappear up his own backside, you know, and behaved absolutely atrociously. Um, but, uh, you know, he seems to have come back. I mean, apparently he is now quite a nice person to be around. You know, I mean, who would have thought that he would be fronting at one point two major bands, you know, fronting ACDC when, uh, um, oh, who's the current singer of, it's not Bon Scott, is it? It's, uh, oh, I don't know. They it's someone I, another one I don't like. <laughs> yeah, but fronting them and Guns N' Roses, and uh, you know, coming on stage on time, and and apparently generally being quite nice and respectful to people. Um, but yeah, the story of Stephen Adler. He was the first person I ever remember being fired from a band. And I, you know, I, again, I say in the book, I remember being age ten and walking down this hill in the suburb of Leeds where I grew up, and my friend saying that Stephen Adler had been fired from this band I was obsessed with. And I've never forgotten it. It just made me feel so awful. I remember thinking, but he can't be, surely this can only be temporary. You know, he's he's on the cross on Axl Rose's arm and on the front of Appetite for Destruction. He's he's the drummer in the band. He's fixed in there. He's a cornerstone of it. 
And this notion that you could just be fired from something you were so integral to or outwardly, you know, kicked out of the gang really struck fear into my heart and gave me this kind of intimation of what adult life could be like. And of course, you know, you look in from an adult perspective, he he did have to be fired, really, although not, in, you know, they, they fired him in a particularly silly and egregious way, making him sign a sobriety contract that stripped him of his royalties if he didn't stick to it. There was no lawyer present, so that was very easy to overturn in court and get him his royalties back, as well as a load of, which again, I say in the book, might not have been the best outcome for him in that his drug addiction was one of the worst. He, he's this boyish character, and you can see it in the way he looks in those pictures of Guns N' Roses. The rest of them are all pouting moodily, and he's beaming away. And, you know, yeah. he just didn't have the adult tools to cope with rock stardom. And, and, and I think beautifully, he didn't have the adult tools to realize that challenging Axel's awful behavior was only going to get him fired. Um, so he he was the one guy that said, hey, Axel, you, you know, you're kind of being a bit of an asshole, like, you know, turning up two hours late. <laughs> to, to... I just realized you were born in 1980 and my son was born in 1980. And his first album was the double album. And so... It was a sweet child of mine it was, you know, it was a great song, but I kept hearing it all day long. And he was upstairs and I was downstairs, but I could still hear it because it was so loud. And then he got this decal from their first album that he put on his door. And then when he left to go to college and we were trying to revamp the house, I couldn't get it off. It had some kind of an adhesive that was like, I figured I would just peel it off, but it wouldn't peel off. I even got like a razor blade. And there was still residue, and I, there probably still is on the door. <laughs> That's a great story about intergenerational music, isn't it? Because we, we yeah, how much we resist it. We, the problem with getting older is that you you hear the antecedents in music in a way that you obviously don't when you're younger, and so everything, you, you know, you you are is normal to be not not cynical, but certainly to listen with more educated ears and hear when things that just don't sound as strikingly original. But I love that. I love the idea of a father trying to get a sticker off a door. <laughs> it's just perfect. I know. Uh, it was, I laughed while I was doing it because I felt the same way you do now. At least I've always had that. But <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, when you talk intergenerational and I, you know, can say I don't like hip hop or I don't like rap, I guess it was when Autotune first came in that I decided, you know, this is not, I don't see this as being real. And then you're talking about the Beatles doing stuff on four tracks and overdubbing and taking the tape and running it 30 feet. Yeah. Uh, and George Martin. But yeah, so I'm stuck in, you know, I can't help it. I'm stuck in that. I'm stuck remembering that. And no one thinks about that anymore. No. Yeah, I mean, I was an ardent hip hop fan. I still am, but I have far fewer records. And yeah, it was the auto, auto tune era in rap music that really marked my sort of departure from being a you know quite predominantly a hip-hop fan i guess um and i thought it would just be like many of these trends and just something that would last for a couple of years but unfortunately the auto tune seems to still be with us doing its filthy work let's um for the last one let's pick um because i saw the rolling thunder review um let's pick mick ronson because He's a really nice guy, and I didn't realize that until I read the book either. I mean, I think he was a really nice guy. Yeah, I mean, it's funny though that, that when you really look into Mick Ronson, there are intimations of, of, of kind of behavior. I'd always seen him as this nice guy that that just didn't look look out for his interests and was right. you know, sidelined by by. But then I think that there was quite a lot of drinking. I think, and then he obviously had children by other women and you know the the, the 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 marriage although they stayed together and were very in love even at the end of his life it was rocky from what i read and so i suspect he was a bit more unstable than i'd realized but i don't think that had anything to do with his any of his you know his firing by barry i think he was always very dependable as a musician and you know he refers to himself as this yeah, I, mean, I imagine most of your your listeners will know, but he's the guy that um, comes down to to help Bowie in his in his fir first breakthrough. But Bowie's kind of living in Bromley and um, 
making this kind of hippie-ish, good but hippie-ish rock and roll, rock music of the um, Hunky Dory era and working with Tony Visconti and um, the boys from Hull, the, the, the bassist and drummer in the band, uh, invite Mick to come down for the second his second attempt to try and make it as a musician in London. He meets Bowie and he's just got this fantastic guitar style, the, the style that you hear throughout Ziggy Stardust. And Bowie immediately notices it, so does Visconti. And he turns Bowie from this, this sort of hippie-ish uh, figure into this much more rock and roll, the, the, really what David Hepworth calls a meat and potatoes rock and roll sound, but then combined with, Bow with Angie Bowie's um, aesthetic instincts and designing the band and giving them all these crazy outfits and the makeup. And uh, um, that's what breaks Bowie into an international superstar and also the management genius of um, Tony, I forgot his name. Uh, he didn't last very long, but he was very good at sending pictures back from America that made Bowie look much bigger than he was, which immediately blew him up in the UK press. Um, and Ronson was, was an integral part of all that, you know, not least in that famous photo, the guitar fellatio photo that Mick Rock took a photo of. And it was again, I think, faxed to the NME to, to deliberately provoke. And um, it's the picture of uh, Bowie kneeling in front of Mick Ronson, looking as though he's um, performing fellatio on him through his guitar. Um, and Ronson was this very meat and potatoes figure. He, he, he was from Hull, he was raised as a Mormon. He found all of this aesthetic stuff a bit baffling, but he knew he was obsessed with music. He taught himself how to score, write string parts and all this stuff. And he, he was the guy that made it all happen. And he refers to himself as like a bricklayer. You know, Bowie would say, I wanted to be a bit like this. And he'd say, oh, all right, then I'll, I'll do that. And he would just do it. And, you know, the, the, again, great moments when the pair of them go and produce Transformer for Lou Reed <laughs> and Lou Reed say, can you make it a little bit more grey? And uh, Mick Ronson's thinking, well, I don't, don't really know what that means, but, you know, I'll just try this. I'll put a bit more of this on it and some, maybe some white noise. And, I like uh, what he goes, you say, he goes, I looked gay, but Bowie was gay. <laughs> yeah, I, I looked like a woman, but I'm more like a man and he's more like a woman. Um, but yeah, he was almost pathologically incapable of looking after his own interests. Right. He wrote all these great string parts. He wrote loads of music, you know, a key writer on Ziggy Stardust and um, a key writer on Aladdin Sane and on Pinups and never credited properly, never given the writing credits he was due or the recording royalties or the, the fees for the performances and the touring um, and never pursued his interests and, and didn't appear. He was almost this otherworldly figure. Um, and so, and he's also a part of two sackings, the first of which he was in on when David Bowie kills off Ziggy Stardust at the Hammersmith Apollo, I think it was. And then a second one that he wasn't in on when he's basically dispatched and, um, a new guitarist is brought in for Barry's move to America. Um, and he just goes, but he goes on and produced all these other great records, produced great music for Morrissey. Um, and he was seen as Barry's Jeff Beck. And then, then Morrissey said, then he became my Jeff Beck momentarily. Um, famously, he, Jack and Diane by, what's the, what's the big American singer called? John Cougar Mellencamp. Yes, yeah. I mean, th th that's pure... Um, Mick Ronson, you know, once you know that, that that's a Mick Ronson sound, that guitar. Um, the, the thing is, the funniest thing is, uh, I and again, you really don't know what's true, but when you listen to uh, uh, Mick Jagger talk about Mick Taylor and, and say how melodic he was and how wonderful he was and how the two of them could get together better than Keith and and talk and sing because he kind of he helped him with the lyrics. And then you listen to Bowie talking about Mick Ronson saying the same kind of thing that he was great. And then like Ziggy Stardust, I think is the best album. And it's these guys that now, but they don't, they didn't give any money. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. I mean, the, the, to, to write the string parts on Life on Mars, which he did, you know, and those 
clearly make that song what it is. And yeah, chronically, to be fair to Barry, he probably, he wasn't treated particularly well financially by various figures and he may not have fully understood, but I think he, he knew that he wasn't, you know, he wasn't paying them fairly. And, and he's an example of an artist with that splinter of ice that I talk about, the, the Graham Green quote, that you need a splinter of ice to succeed. Yeah. Well, so like, okay, now, so we'll really end it because I always take a long time to end, but everything makes me think of something else. But the one thing that runs through the book and maybe caused a good deal of it is drugs. I mean, drugs are a big part of all of this. Everybody in your book, pretty much. Drugs, yeah. alcohol. Yeah. Yeah, there's a chapter about heroin just because I, as I was writing, I... I almost came to feel that the book was primarily about heroin, you know, the, the, the fact that it just ruined so many of these great projects. And yeah, I mean, you know, in a way it's it's obvious really, isn't it? Music takes place, it's performed at night time. It's not like any other art in that sense. These people are on the road night after night. There's friends and fans in each place. And for them, it's the first night and they want to party and you know, you're going on stage, you might have a drink. Once you've had one drink, then you might have another drink. And once you've had a couple of drinks, you're open to all sorts of stuff. And, you know, there's, there's drugs flying around these places. And, you know, the drugs are in some ways integral to music and to losing yourself in the, you know, music is, is visceral. It's not, it's not like lying in bed reading a book. It's there to be enjoyed in this, in this moment and community um so it makes sense that drugs are, are a key danger in music but the prevalence of heroin and, and in these great bands that we've been talking about from the 60s and 70s no one knew how to deal with it there was no real structure nowadays a good manager would say this guy is developing a problem with heroin we're going to immediately get him out we're going to get him treated or you know do our best to do that without necessarily having to fire the person you know you can always you can always deal with a situation with enough thought and planning and there's these terrible you know the, the one that really haunts me is Danny Witten who prefigures Kurt Cobain in some ways with the chronic treating chronic pain with heroin and Neil Young said every musician gets one other musician they play best with my guy was Danny Witten and his life was just destroyed by heroin and without Danny Witten you don't get that heavy proto grunge sound of Everybody knows this is nowhere and Cinnamon Girl and Down by the River and Cowgirl in the Sand. And so he was the key musical partner for one of the greatest musicians ever and had such a short life and career because he just couldn't, he was just taken into the worst kind of heroin addiction. Um, yeah, maybe the biggest tragedy of, of each of these is that, or most of them, is that they were the ones who propelled, whether it's like I said, uh, Mick Taylor with Midnight Rambler or any of the Exile on Main Street uh, songs that he didn't get credit for either, um, they actually propelled the band to the place, as you, especially with Neil Young and Crazy Horse. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A lot of these figures, in a way, that was the pleasure of writing the book because although there's a lot, of, uh, there's a lot of tragedy in there. It was great to explore the contribution these figures made and then realize that it was probably bigger than most of us realize in, in many of their cases. So um, so that that was a that was a nice element of the book. Well, that's a good way to end it because I think that's what the book actually does. These people would not have been recognized other than you're telling their stories. You know, you think, okay, Pete Best, you think uh, you think of McTaylor, you think of uh, Flo, you think of so many of them, but that's all you do is just think about them. So the backstory has been really helpful for me. And like I said, it's just led me down so many different paths. So I really appreciate your book and for you to talking to me today. So oh, thank so you so much. I, this is one of the best conversations I've had around the book, actually. So thank you very much. And I'm sorry that we kept it slightly 60s and 70s. Uh, I know. You. That was me. <laughs> well, your, your listeners, there are some stories in there that are a bit more modern. So uh, hopefully, yeah, no, I'm, in I'm there. sorry about that. I couldn't. No, help. no, no. I mean, it's great. It's just great fun to talk about these stories, isn't it? So I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Okay, I hope to speak to you next time. Thanks. Please send me the link when it when it goes live. I'd love to. I will. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Lovely to meet you and enjoy the show. Thanks very much. All right. Bye bye. bye for now.